I've noticed some old demons popping up in the last couple of weeks, and I wanted to address it today. We're going to talk about the courage to create. Hi, I'm Lynn. Welcome to my channel. Join me on my journey as I sew, knit, and craft my way through my stash, exploring creative possibilities and stretching my imagination to fulfill my stash's potential and bring it to life. I talked about my design process in episode 5 and introduced a new project, a column dress with a kimono jacket that I hope to wear to the theater or a similar event if we're ever actually able to go to such events ever again. Interestingly enough, suddenly all of those unfinished projects laying around got all my attention instead of my theater outfit as I've named it. I convinced myself I should complete something before I start something new, that these projects were like energy leaks I needed to plug up. The real reason, though, is making things, especially my own designs, trigger a lot of insecurities in me. Not the actual making part, that brings me a lot of joy, but the emotional baggage it brings up, not being good enough, judgment, criticism, comparison, and doubt. I thought this would be a good time to explore why. I found an article about courage by Melissa Kiss. I'm not sure if that's her real name, but that's the name on the byline, which I've linked below. She notes that the root word of courage is core, which is Latin for heart. An early definition for courage is to speak one's mind by telling all one's heart. She says, and I quote, over time, this definition has changed, and today we typically associate courage with heroic and brave deeds. But in my opinion, this definition fails to recognize the inner strength and level of commitment required for us to actually speak honestly and openly about who we are and about our experiences, good and bad. Speaking from our hearts is what I think of as ordinary courage. Unquote. How often have our feelings been invalidated or unacknowledged by other people, brushed aside, ignored, belittled, or even ridiculed, just because that wasn't their experience or didn't align with their beliefs, and as a result, we hid them? How often have we invalidated or acknowledged or not acknowledged other people's feelings because that hasn't been our experience or aligned with our beliefs? Obviously, this is a subject that could get really deep, but let's keep it in context here. What does it have to do with making things? So knitting, sewing, and creating has been my way of speaking from the heart. And early on, I internalized the belief that it wasn't valuable because it was brushed aside as unimportant. The thing that interested me the most, that brought me the most joy, was considered insignificant, unimportant, and irrelevant in my family. It was fine as a hobby, nothing more. But it wasn't only my family. Over the years, I've made numerous gifts for people. Some people look down on handmade gifts, and I don't think that they realize that making things isn't a cheaper alternative than buying something when you think about the cost of our time and materials. Now, I don't give handmade gifts for the accolades. I do it because I enjoy the process. That person means something to me, and I believe they will like it. But when I was younger, I was always looking outside myself for validation, and when a gift wasn't well received, it was another chip in my self-esteem, more proof that I was somehow flawed and should just relegate this desire to the back shelf of my life. There are some personalities that forge ahead in spite of what other people think, rebels that use other people's indifference or disapproval as motivation to go forward and carve out a life of meaning, purpose, and joy, despite what other people think, people who laugh in the face of convention to follow the beat of their own drum. <sighs> Unfortunately, I was not such a child. I was a good girl. I followed the rules. I look for validation from other people, and I waited for permission. Needless to say, this had a negative effect on me. Imagine believing a huge part of you isn't worth anything. I felt like an outsider looking in. 
my nose pressed up against the glass, you know, in awe of this magical creative world, waiting desperately for an invitation to join. And I never got one. I ended up with this, taking this incredible gift I was given, whether it was through genetics, divine intervention, whatever, and I let it slip away, never making it a priority or giving it the respect it deserved. And as a result, I deprived myself of a lot of joy, meaning, and fulfillment. I lived a second-rate life. And I'm not telling you this because I'm looking for pity, sympathy, validation, or approval. You know, I'm not a victim. I don't blame my parents. It's just the way it was. And I have my own theories about how this belief came about. But you know what? It really doesn't matter. What matters is the awareness I have now as I untangle myself from this belief to create a first-rate life, a life that embraces my truths, passions, and gifts. We all have interests, whether that be sports, music, cars, dogs, crafting, gardening, fashion, art, nature, cooking, photography, chess, miniatures, advocating for a cause. Whatever it is, it's important to prioritize and carve out a space for our life in it for no other reason than we enjoy it and it interests us. We don't need anybody's permission to do it. We don't have to be good at it. We don't have to monetize it. We don't have to apologize for it. We don't have to justify it to anyone. And I understand for some people that's easier said than done. And I say this not only to help others, but also as a reminder for myself, for I believe my interests, my passions, these things that make my soul come alive are the language of my heart. And we all have that in us. And we need to speak our truth in order to live purposeful, meaningful lives. And yeah, that takes courage, a hell of a lot of it. And, you know, I've had regrets and I wish things had been different. I wish there had been some adult in my life that said, that looked at me and thought, wow, you have this really, this creative drive here. Let me nurture it for you. Let me feed you all this creativity and inspiration. But you know what? That didn't happen. And there's no going back to change that. So when that happens to us, we have to start where we're at and take baby steps from there. And it's important to know that it is never too late. Never. I think all families carry, and I'll call them wounds for lack of a better word, they all have these wounds that get passed on from generation to generation. And I've been able to spot the patterns in my own family and understand how time and circumstances have shaped my parents and my grandparents. And I often remind myself that in spite of my upbringing, in spite of being exposed to these familial wounds, that I was able to break the pattern when it came to raising my son. I'm not sure if I was conscious that I was doing it at the time, but I was one of his biggest cheerleaders. I nurtured and supported his interests. I let him know that they had value. And whether it was dinosaurs, drawing, or video games, I invested in them, in him, because they were important to him, even if I didn't understand why. I taught him to value those things that interested him. I bought him books. I signed him up in for classes at the community at the local college. Well, <laughs> it was SMU for crying out loud. That's more than a local community college. That's one hell of a good college. I signed him up for game design classes in there over the summers. And I feel a profound sense of relief, joy, and gratitude when he tells me that he had a great childhood, because I can't say that about my own. The point I want to make 
is often the things that matter to us, that grab our interest, are not seen as valuable, especially in the arts and craft world. The arts struggle to remain funded. Schools have cut them out of their curriculum. But if this year has taught us anything, it's just how important they really are for the human experience. Think of the books, movies, shows, and other modes of entertainment we have consumed over the past year because we haven't been able to do much else. And unfortunately, as in the case with me, and I'm sure many others can relate, I didn't value my desire and drive to make things, to be creative. And my life was much poorer for it. I held myself back waiting for permission, waiting for that invitation. But being alone for the last year, I realized just how much a part of me it was and how integral it is to my life. I'm just about finished with that cable rib sweater I mentioned in a previous video. And when I'm through, I'm going to vote, devote my attention to my theater outfit. So am I miraculously cured of those doubts, judgments, criticism, and comparisonitis? Hell no. <laughs> but understanding the importance of creating, I've learned to do the work anyway. In a way, it's the actual making that releases the hold that these unproductive thoughts have on me. The more I make, the less power I have. So I'm going to continue to make. Please share in the comments your struggles, whether it's coming to terms with your cre creative de desires or what it may be, and what you are doing, if anything, to overcome them or what you have done. I'd love to hear them. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and share with your friends. If you want to follow me on my journey, hit subscribe and the bell to receive notifications when a new video is up. You can also follow along on my blog. Links are down below. Happy distashing, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye.